to give a little bit of background, why, why am I here talking about Chinese healthcare? Um, so originally, uh, and it come from a background in NHS clinical practice, um, spent 12 years working clinically, but in the last three years I've been working in consulting. Um, I have a really uh, privileged, fantastic position to spend a lot of time working overseas, looking at international healthcare systems. Um, I was just totting up on the way here and uh, spent time in 12 countries on nearly 25 occasions in the past two years. So it's a real opportunity to get under the bonnet and have a look at different healthcare systems. And healthcare systems by their very nature tend to be very parochial and inward looking. So to be able to get some external context and understanding of different Different systems, how they work, how they operate, the challenge and the opportunities is a real privilege of this position. Um, so I want to talk in the next 15 minutes a little bit about the Chinese healthcare system and I think I should say that out of all of those countries that I've worked in over the past few years, the Chinese healthcare system is the one that excites me the most. Why is that? I think the potential opportunities, um, albeit we'll acknowledge the challenges, uh, are some of the most significant that are out there in healthcare at the moment, and I'll, I'll take some time to explain why and why I see that's the case and what I think some of those um, challenges are. What excites me most about the Chinese healthcare system is the scale and the pace. Um, I think to give you a few anecdotes, on my first visit to China, um, I spent some time in a, um, a large city which will be nameless uh, in, in the west of the country, um, visited one of the hospitals there. It was my first time visiting a Chinese hospital and we arrived at a sort of megalopolis structure of uh, the sort of size that would far surpass the largest university teaching hospital in the UK which was very impressive but even more impressive to find out that that wasn't the largest hospital in the city and that there were several of these size institutions that were available. Uh, that hospital turned out to have 4,000 beds, which to put in context, the largest hospital in the UK, which arguably may be QE in Birmingham or St George's down the road in Tooting, at about 1,200, 1,200 beds, so um, only just over a quarter of the size. Um, and that Chinese hospital wasn't the largest, 7,000 beds is the largest size hospital. Now, that made impressive numbers, there are some problems underlying why those hospitals need to be the size that they are and the structure of the system that supports that, and we'll come on to more of that in a moment. But nonetheless, work that I've looked into shows that um, for, uh, if you look at it, take a worldwide international view, China has more hospital beds than any other country in the world. Now, I will spend a lot of time telling you why measurement of hospital beds is not a good marker of anything in healthcare. But nonetheless, from a sheer scale factor, um, you, you can't ignore the size of this. Um, I think, as I mentioned, that hospital was just one of four in that particular city. Um, the scale of growth in the number of healthcare institutions in China in recent years has been unsurpassed. Uh, the country totals now just under 29,000 hospitals, uh, which is arguably not enough to deliver the scale um, of demand that there is within healthcare at the country at the moment. But the pace of growth has accelerated in the past few years. Contrast that to somewhere like the UK, um, obviously uh, it's a much significantly smaller population, but for a very well-formed, well-developed healthcare system, we have 168 NHS trusts currently. Um, that's a, a manageable, governable number. Um, so it gives you an idea of some of the complexity of how you manage healthcare in China against that setting. The final point, which I'm sure you're all well aware of, is just the scale of the population and therefore the need. 1.4 billion people makes for the largest single market um, in, in any country or a sector in the world. So when you put that against the backdrop of some of the changes that we're going to in a few more minutes, um, the size and scale of healthcare in China um, is, for me, one of the standout factors um, that really impresses me. And you look at the sort of companies that, um, uh, that we're dealing with, I visited um, one recently, they are um, dealing with state divestment of healthcare in China at the moment. So this was a company that had formed out of um, a state-owned enterprise that had divested its healthcare services. Uh, we anticipated perhaps beforehand that we might be looking at six or seven hostels they're running. Um, they're running just short of 360 with a, um, an ambition to acquire up to another thousand from other state-owned hospitals. So the scale of what they're having to deliver within healthcare is unsurpassed anywhere, anywhere else in the world that are certainly that I've seen. Now within that lie a lot of challenges um, but I'm also going to put it to you that within some of those challenges lie some of the greatest opportunities um, in healthcare in China. But before I go into that I'll talk a little bit more about the pace um, of scale of change in, in China to set the scene and so my personal reflections around that. I think for many people, if you look at the, the bare facts of the Chinese healthcare system as to where it lies today, um, 
GDP spend on healthcare is just under 7%, albeit growing. Um, that's well below the average for the OECD, as you, as you might anticipate. Um, but actually, that's growing significantly and will continue to grow over the coming years. Um, I think to look at that fact alone um, ignores how far the Chinese healthcare system has come in such a um, short space of time. Um, before I was last out in China back in um, Easter, there was a BBC News article that I, um, had just come out reflecting back on the barefoot doctors of China. And I think for many people that is still the image of the, of the healthcare system. Um, but when you consider that only uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, uh, less than half the country had access to uh, provision of any basic healthcare insurance, that's now over 95% of the population now, albeit a relatively shallow um, uh, uh, insurance system. But nonetheless, the, the pace of change um, that's been involved in that has been significant. And that has meant um, a sort of positive virtuous cycle for the population. If you look back at that same point uh, when the rollout really began apace, you were looking typically at about 50% of healthcare spending being out of pocket costs um, for individuals. Um, that's now fallen to about a third of healthcare spending. And that makes a very big difference for the, for the individual um, and for their families who are having to spend on healthcare. Um, it, it's an old adage that's said many times that investment of a country in health is an investment in wealth. And all the time that people are spending money on catastrophic healthcare expenditure, they're not only struggling with the, um, with the personal costs and um, burden and therefore wider lack of um, uh, economic productivity of that individual because of the healthcare problem, um, but society bears the burden of their catastrophic expenditure. Um, so not only the economic loss, but their own um, potential spending that would have, um, would have come from that. So as you say, an investment in health is an investment in wealth, and so that investment in a albeit shallow level of healthcare insurance has made a um, substantial benefit to many people and to the um, economy as a whole. What are the drivers of this pace? Um, uh, I was recently uh, speaking with one of um, Roy Lilly, you may have come across as one of the healthcare commentators in the UK, who has a very simple way of looking at this, which I quite like, which is about, um, from a UK perspective, the drivers can be broken down into um, people, pounds, policy and politics. And while it's difficult to um, uh, go into the rather entwined nature of politics and policy in China, we'll come on to that in a second, it is important, but to consider what the other drivers are that are pushing um, this pace of change. I think the first point is actually if you look at the people themselves, the nature of health and wellness is changing in China, and I think that's well recognised. Um, they are fighting many problems that we see in many countries around the world of an ageing population, of um, chronic disease. But actually, when you look at those in greater detail, again, it comes back to the scale of what they're um, currently dealing with. Uh, by 2050, over 50% of all elderly people in Asia will be based within China. It already has the highest elderly population um, within Asia, and that is going to grow significantly. Now, that's obviously entwined with previous politics and policy, and it will be several generations before um, the impact of the changes in the um, one-child system goes forward. But actually, unfortunately, the health system is going to bear the brunt of those problems. Um, the elderly dependency ratio for China is, is one of the highest and is only going to grow in the developing world because of that shortage of younger people to care for them. And we'll come on to some of the changes that that will drive in the healthcare system in a moment. Um, I think also the other big factor is if you look at development of chronic disease in China, um, there are some interesting factors that uh, come into play that we perhaps don't see elsewhere, such as the extraordinarily high rates of smoking within the population. 50% of um, men smoke in China, some of the highest rates of uh, uh, new cases of lung cancer anywhere in the world, and the uh, emphasis on um, early diagnosis and treatment of, uh, of cancers, particularly with a focus on lung cancer because of that, is driving healthcare. But that also plays into long-term chronic disease, pulmonary disease, um, the third highest cause of death in China now, exacerb and any benefits um, in screening, diagnosis and treatment around lung cancer and public health in investment in um, smoking, unfortunately being offset by uh, the rising um, problems around uh, pollution challenges in China. So some factors you see in healthcare in China that are perhaps not replicated so, so widely elsewhere, um, some that are, 
uh, if you take diabetes, for example, um, the percentage of population with diabetes in China is actually slightly higher than the US. But when you consider the much greater population, again, it's a factor of scale. The absolute number of diabetics in China far exceeds any other country um, in the world. And again, that is causing um, a need for a pace of change in the country in delivery of health care. Um, and I think the final point relates to the expectations of the population. Um, as you'll be well aware, the rapid growth of middle class and the increasing expectation around what healthcare can deliver, and often that expectation far outstrips the ability of what the health system can deliver, uh, are causing significant pressures on healthcare, health system, and, and health delivery. One word I'll say about the intertwined policy and politics. Um, a personal reflection from many of the um, health systems and countries that I look at. Um, some of the places that I've been most impressed at their ability to drive long-term planning and change in healthcare, long-term strategy and implementation of that, are places like Singapore, uh, like Malaysia, um, Saudi, and the 2030 plan Healthy China. The one thing I will say is that all of these nations are a particular political persuasion that facilitates long-term planning, and when that combines with a country prioritising and strategising for improvement of the healthcare system, then that can only lead to good. Uh, and I think that's really something that we're seeing now um, over the last few uh, plans and the forthcoming plans for China at the moment. It is now a priority area and a strategy. It's intertwined with some areas of economic development and strategy that I'll come on to in a moment. And so I think going back to where I started this point about the current view of where Chinese healthcare is, if you're looking perhaps only two, three years ago, your view of where Chinese healthcare is is already out of date. Uh, and if you're looking at the current picture right now and uh, perhaps looking at that compared to the OECD and thinking there is, there's a long way to go, um, it would be remiss not to consider how far China has come, but also to, it would be remiss not to consider that this long-term planning will continue. So these reforms are only half, not even halfway there. It's really important to look at how far healthcare is going to go forward. And my final comment on this point, it's worth reflecting um, whatever uh, the, um, your political persuasion or policy persuasion might be, that we're just coming towards the end of the first NHS five-year forward view. Uh, we've struggled to have any long-term planning in the national healthcare system at all. Uh, and so I think actually the ability to long-term plan and put long-term strategies in place in China is um, something that many people in health policy would look on quite enviously at. So my final two points will be around the challenges and opportunities within healthcare in China, and really these are very much intertwined with both um, the scale and the pace again. One of the big issues within healthcare at the moment in many rapidly developing and emerging markets is that the ambition and aspiration of the government to put in place healthcare reform and healthcare growth to support the population, um, it's very difficult to match that and deliver with the health system that they find that they have in front of them. And indeed, to be able to keep up with the expectations and ambitions, it's unrealistic to think that public healthcare systems could develop at the same pace um, that the uh, expectations and ambitions wish them to. Now that means in many emerging markets, um, the public sector is linking with the private sector in order to uh, develop and grow, and I think that is absolutely just the case um, in China as well. So there are huge opportunities um, right around healthcare delivery, healthcare infrastructure, but particularly healthcare insurance is one area that I would flag as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the rollout of basic health insurance to the population, it is very shallow. Um, and there's a question mark with rising healthcare costs and exp expenditure, how far um, the public sector would wish to go in supporting um, rising healthcare costs and, and meeting future healthcare developments. There is a strong push within um, China to encourage private healthcare insurance to supplement this. And I think there are huge growth opportunities within this area in China. Um, a recent forecast um, anticipated that the private um, healthcare insurance market in China would double in renminbi terms um, by 2020. <coughs> So you are seeing a, a, an element of deregulation and, and positive uh, drive and encouragement in this area. Uh, and I think that is the only way, realistically, that the health system is going to be developed um, at a continuous, sustainable pace. Um, I think the other challenges um, are myriad, and I think I, I, I am and I want to paint a very favourable picture because I see the future opportunity of healthcare in China as being huge. But some of the areas that need tackling particularly are around the workforce. 
um, the lack of pay for doctors, the shortage of doctors, the inability of them to meet patient expectations leading to violence in some cases and, uh, and the general drive for people not to particularly want to focus on um, medicine and medical professions because of this environment they're working on. There are already steps being taken to address these factors and some of the opportunities I'll come on to a moment actually drive off the back of that shortage of um, the healthcare workforce. Um, the lack of not quite absence but major shortage of primary care within the country is something that's recognised and being addressed but one of the big challenges I would lay down is the difficulty that will be around this. There is a culture of seeking health care from those mega hospitals that I spoke to. Indeed the reason why those hospitals are so large is the absence of primary care and even where there is primary care patients choose to seek care at hospitals instead. Um, in order to properly staff and create a primary care system the likes of which National Health Service is so strong in would mean an extra 120,000 primary care physicians. Um, knowing how long it takes to train doctors and against that environmental backdrop of um, medicine um, within China it's difficult to imagine that that can realistically be delivered. Um, I can touch on some of the areas relating to pharma as well and some of the issues around um, because of the low pay for doctors, the um, issues around um, payment mechanisms and how some medical staff choose to supplement their income through um, uh, uh, the payment system for pharma, which I think is something that is recognised and is being addressed but is still a major problem. But the opportunities that spin out of these are also myriad, just as these challenges are important. And again, that is because of the pace of change and the scale and therefore the size of the problems. I think. Um, for me, one of the most exciting um, areas and elements I find within Chinese healthcare is this alignment of government policy, strategy and investment um, in areas that are really cross-market sector, but focus, uh, a focus of them all lies in healthcare. There is the government's ambition to be a major force in pharma and development, um, the government's uh, ambition for artificial intelligence to be a major driver. Um, to pick up that latter point within healthcare, I think um, if you look at the many opinions of many um, clinicians, basic scientists, the research drive and growth is stupendous within China, but it tends not to be at the basic science element. So is the opportunity there for basic drug development? Perhaps less so. Um, is the opportunity there for areas that actually involve um, uh, scale that involve data that involve um, the power of processing and analysis rather than that basic science well absolutely yes it's the largest single market um, in a country that has a thirst for data and a perhaps not quite the GDPR regulations that uh, we're all currently facing in our inboxes at the moment um, across the EU the um, AI is only as good as the data that it feeds on. The opportunity to plug this in for healthcare is absolutely huge. Um, if you look at other areas that rely perhaps less on basic science and more on um, data processing capacity, the other example I would give would be genomics. Um, uh, Beijing Genomics Institute has the largest processing power in genomics in the world with the largest number of sequences. So I think while we perhaps have traditionally have looked backwards uh, um, healthcare evolution, discovery, research and development. Historically, if we look to what the future of healthcare is around data, around analytics, around artificial intelligence, around genomics and personal medicine, then actually the future is very bright for research and development in China. Couple that with huge research investment in healthcare and couple that with government um, policies and strategies that align with supporting those market sectors and the potential is huge. And it's for these reasons that I think um, if you look Taking a forward view in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, healthcare in China will set the trajectories and um, determine some of the future uh, treatments, policies, and priorities for healthcare across the rest of the world. Thank you very much.